What's up guys, Pot by Pigs 4 Life here, and today we're back with another episode of Conservation Carnival in Planet Zoo. So, man, it's been a while since we've been back here. So if you guys remember, we finished work on the padding zoo by adding in this massive South American enclosure. And since then, we have been having loads of babies. So, lots of baby capybaras, a couple baby llamas, um, there should also be a handful of baby caption monkeys. Um, really quickly, I do apologize for the long break in videos. Um, I've been very busy, especially with the quarter ending and my teachers needing to, uh, get grades in and, like, tie up loose ends. Oh boy, we got a lot of stuff going on, so let's pause it for now. Um, see if we can spawn anything. Uh, yep, everyone's hanging out by the lake because it gets hot in these parts. Um, ooh, baby tortoise, baby Galapagos tortoise. Oh. So, now that our petting zoo is fully completed, it is time that we move on to our next area of the zoo, which is going to be the drive through safari. So, basically, the idea we're going to go with this is, I don't know if you guys have ever seen those videos where the people are driving and they're freaking out because the animals are sticking their head inside the vehicle because they want food. So we're going for that sort of aesthetic. So basically the idea is, uh, this is where cars would enter. It says enter here on both sides. They would enter, they would go all throughout the enclosures, and they would exit right over here. And then right over here would be where the guests would pick up food for the animals. So that way they can roll down the window and feed the animals as they please. So I'd imagine that right here, they would get the food for the animals. So they pull in, you know, maybe we'll do like a, um, maybe we'll do a, um, where, let me let me try and find it. Man, it's been a while since I played this game. Information center. There we go. Oh, it must be because the uh, must be because of the tour track. Uh, we'll we'll put it we'll put it there. I know technically that would cause a little bit of traffic, but you know what? Like, we're it, it, we're gonna have to roll with it. So yeah. So basically, the cars would drive in. They'd pick up some food. They'd pay for like. Uh, admission, um, and then they would just drive on into the enclosures where they would then make videos of the animals sticking their heads in the windows and get millions of views on, like, you know, Facebook or wherever else, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so here's the plan. So... We're probably going to split this into two episodes. Uh, we'll do two exhibits this episode and two exhibits in the next episode. So here's the plan. So I went over this last episode, but the plan is... This is going to be for the Gemsbok, because I feel like I hardly ever use Gemsbok because they don't have interspecies bonus. This will be for American Bison. This will be for some Mongolian animals, so... The Chevalsky's horse, Bactrian camel, and Saga antelope will go in here. This will be a giant African enclosure. So basically, each habitat is going to be primarily hoofstock, but in this habitat, we will add in the common ostrich, along with the plain zebra, the African buffalo, both species of wildebeest, and the sable antelope. Because they all have interspecies bonus. And then right here, is where we will put some staff facilities. So, um, yeah, one thing I will do is I will add in this, uh, I will add in a gate so that way it looks as if the staff, when they come into work each day, they would, uh, 
and drive right through the paddock. Um, or, you know, maybe there's... Actually, no, here's an idea. This is a family-run business, so this would be, like, where, like, the, the main staff come in. Uh, this is where they would, like, park their cars and everything. Um, then they would drive all the way through, and they'd end up here. So yeah, now before we add in any animals, we of course need to set up this staff facility. So uh, I'm gonna go for the more like utilitarian Planet Zoo theme. All right guys, so while we're working on the staff area, I just wanted to mention that we're trying to hit 100 subscribers before the end of 2024 so if you're enjoying this video so far please make sure to leave a like and subscribe so that way we can hopefully reach our subscriber goal there we go all right so there's a little bit of empty space don't get me wrong but honestly what i might do actually is i think that's where we'll add heart shelters And of course, the workers need somewhere to park their cars. Okay, so already, I'm really happy with this staff setup. We've got not one, not two, but three hard shelters for the animals. There's still a little bit of unused space left, but already looks so much better. And then what we can even do is let's get construction, go to props. Uh, let's get a couple of these Jeeps to make it look as if... There are people here who are working. There we go. So, yeah. So, and then honestly, what I would even imagine is they've all got their cars like right over here. And they each individually park their cars right here. But then there are also some Jeeps that they use to get over to where they work. I dig that. All right, but one thing we do have to do is, unfortunately, we do have to, uh, we do have to, uh, move this. There we go. This is where they park their cars, they being the staff. Let's honestly just move it, like, right there, because otherwise, what I don't want to happen is I don't want for there to be, like, traffic in the street because of people, like, all going in at once. So, yeah. One thing that I definitely want to do throughout the enclosures is I want to keep the track visible. I know it looks artificial, but if you ever go to those drive through safaris, there's, like, a paved path for the cars to go on. So, yeah. So, I want to keep that.
there you go. So now the tour ride, quote unquote, is fully operational. So now all we have to do is hire some staff and then we can get our first animals. All right, so we've got plenty of new staff members. So one other thing that I also remember I have to do is I have to build the fence around the hard shelters. Also, I do apologize if I sound rather nasally. I've once again become very sick. I do not know why. Um, this year, my immune system has been not good. Like, I've been very sick as of lately, and I do not know why. Like, I don't remember being this sick, like, ever. Like, I was sick in October, I was sick in December for Christmas, I was sick in February, and I am once again sick now. So, yeah, um, there. So, now, I think we can officially get some new animals. So, I think that we're going to start with the Gemsbok, and then after that we will do the Mongolian herbivore section. Let's see, we got a total of nine Gemsbok, and they're all gonna go right in here. Okay, so I wasn't able to find too many Gemsbok facts, but here's what I was able to find. So, Gemsbok are the largest species of oryx, and are often also called the South African oryx. One cool thing about Gemsbok is that they can shift their diets depending on what is available. When grass is plentiful, they are generally grazers, but during the dry season, they switch to being more browsers, eating different shrubs, and they've even been known to dig up to a meter deep when in search of roots and tubers. Another thing to note about the Gemsbok is that they've been introduced to certain areas of New Mexico by the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. They believed that this would help boost activities such as trophy hunting, which would add more diversity to the economy. However, due to the lack of natural predators such as lions, the Gemsbok were able to thrive in this new environment. And because of that, there are now currently 3,000 Gemsbok in New Mexico, and many scientists fear the negative consequence of Gemsbok overgrazing and overbrowsing in the area. I had mentioned this in a previous video, I think it was about the wild boar, but you can't blame these invasive species for just being animals. They're simply just doing all that they can to survive. And one thing I've seen in a lot of different pieces of media is that in nature, there really is no good guy or bad guy. There's just those who survive and those who don't. Alright guys, so I couldn't find too many ideas for the Gemsbok enclosure, but honestly, I don't think it turned out that bad. Like, obviously, it's not my all-time favorite habitat that I've already done. Oh my gosh, hang on. Look at this cool shot of the Gemsbok drinking. That's, that's a really cool shot. Oh, that's a really cool shot of the Gemsbok drinking. Uh, honestly, I definitely can see why I don't really use the Gemsbok a lot in my zoos. Because, as you can see, they require a lot of sand. And I was able to, um, find a way to add in, like, grass and, like, just enough sand so that way they'd be happy. But also add in some grass so that way the 
habitat doesn't look like an absolute wasteland. But regardless, I also wasn't able to like find some cool stuff to do with the foliage. So because of that, I just scattered like bushes and grasses around. Uh, I used a lot of these rock pieces. Um, so yeah, not the greatest habitat that I've ever built but also not the worst habitat that I've also built. So then another thing, as you can see, is right over here, I've got it, like, all sandy, because, you know, it's, like, where their food is, where their shelter is, so, of course, they're going to be, like, kicking it all up and, like, all congregating in this area. But, yeah, no, honestly, I don't use Gemsbok a lot in my zoos. Like, I rarely ever use Gemsbok because of, like I said the like very limited selection of foliage you can use um but yeah honestly like i'm kind of sad that i don't use these guys more often because they are beautiful animals i must say honestly the big thing is it stinks that you can't put these guys with other animals because these guys would be a great like addition for like a mixed enclosure Ooh, and already we're expecting some offspring. One last thing I have to say about this habitat before we move on is I like that at least, unlike Augusta Zoo, this habitat is a lot more spacious. They've got so much space to run around and graze. And yeah, so again, not a bad habitat, but at the same time, not the world's greatest habitat I've ever made. Also loved how I uh, hid the rubbing pillar amongst the tree. Um, so yeah, so now the final habitat we're gonna work on for this episode is going to be the Mongolian habitat. So that's gonna be Bactrian camels, that's gonna be uh, Shervalsky's horse, and Saiga antelope. Alrighty guys, so this time we've got a lot of animal facts to cover. So let's start with the Bactrian camels. So Bactrian camels are by far some of the most adaptable animals in the world. Many people know camels for being able to live in extremely hot desert environments. And yes, it is true that Bactrian camels can survive in temperatures as hot as 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit but they can also survive up to negative 30 degrees Celsius or negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. You see, the Gobi Desert is not like other deserts. While only a portion of it is an actual sandy desert, the majority of it consists of naturally occurring springs, forests, mountains, and grasslands. And don't get me wrong, it still gets very, very hot in the summer, much like other deserts. However, in the winter months, it has actually been known to snow in the Gobi Desert. So back to the Bactrian camel, they're the only known land mammal who is capable of drinking salt water without experiencing any negative side effects. Also, just want to clear things up, the humps on a camel is in fact used to store fat. This is because when a Bactrian camel has enough fat reserve, the humps stay upright. But if they aren't getting enough fat content, the humps become droopy. So now, moving on to the Shavalski's horse. So, in Mongolia, where they are from, these animals are often called Taki, which is the word for spirit. These guys are the last truly wild horses in the world. The wild horses and mustangs that are found throughout North America and Australia were originally domestic horses, but have since returned to the wild, making them considered feral horses. The Shavalski's horse also has 66 chromosomes, which is similar to the 64 chromosomes that domestic horses have. Speaking of domestic horses, Shavalski's horses have also been known to hybridize with domestic horses, and the most unusual part is that these hybrids are actually fertile, meaning they are able to produce offspring, unlike other equine hybrids such as mules. So now we're going to wrap things up with the Saiga antelope. So the Saiga antelope is well known for its massive nose. This nose allows for the Saiga to survive extreme seasonal shifts from unbearably hot summers to unbearably cold winters. They act as both dust filters and blood coolers, 
during the summer and radiators in winter to warm the cold air before entering the lungs. This is a similar adaptation to the Takins, which were added to Augusta Zoo, in which it actually takes more heat energy to inhale cooler air into the lungs. Therefore, they use that bulbous nose to heat up the cooler air so that way it's less work for the lungs. During the winter, the Saiga also develops a thick winter coat that it can easily shed once winter is over. So that's it for animal facts. So as you can see, this enclosure is heavily based on the grassland aspect that I had mentioned about the Gobi Desert. Um, and yeah, as you can see, it was very hard to fill up the open space just like it was with the Gemsbok habitat, but this time I was able to use a lot of those nettles and especially the tall grasses. So here, what I decided to do is I decided to turn that little staff parking lot, quote unquote, into a little bit of a guest section. And as you can see earlier, I had added some buses so that we guests would be able to enter in that area. And I had decided in order to attract more guests into that area, I had decided to make that little staff parking lot, quote unquote, into sort of like a guest section. So as you can see, I am adding in the souvenir shop, which I had only used once in a zoo, um, like that I had made off camera. Um, as you can see, adding in the toilets as well as some other amenities or uh, shops. Man, I keep using shops and amenities interchangeably because of Jurassic World Evolution 2. Uh, so yeah, uh, adding in some food for them to eat, added in a little drink stand, some toilets, and then I added this like Bernie's Bakes stand as sort of like something that the guests can like walk to and from. Also, I added in a little bit of an area where the guests can maybe see the Mongolian animals, um, also some tables and some umbrellas because it does get very hot in these parts, like I had mentioned, uh, a couple benches for them to rest on. And yeah, that pretty much wraps up the construction. Okay, hopefully the fact that there is a zoo entrance here means that this entire area is considered part of the zoo. Hopefully, uh, yes, they are being urged to go on the safari, which is great. But yeah, I'm pretty happy with how this habitat turned out. Man, already we're expecting some, not only Shavalsky's horse offspring, but we are also expecting some baby sagas. Oh, oh. No idea what's happening there. Uh, but yeah, uh, so yeah, let's take a look at some of these animals. I love the albino Bactrian camel. And then there's one with like another like shade Ooh, right here, I think it is. Ooh, and we're expecting some baby Bactrian camels. On top of that, we also have some baby Gemsbok! Oh, look how cute! Oh, and the little noises they make are so adorable. So yeah, we've got so many new baby animals on the way. Uh, have we- Oh my gosh, we already have baby Saigas! <gasps> look at them! So adorable! Oh my gosh, I love these little guys so much. But yeah, I'm pretty happy with how this area of the zoo is turning out so far. Also, must admit, this like entire area is looking awesome. Like, I love the um, modular souvenir shop. Like, this little addition is awesome. Uh, on top of that, the little, the entire guest area just looks fantastic. And like the guests are able to go on the safari tour. These guests are on the safari tour. And perfect. All sorts of 
like good view stuff. I've I've never gotten this message. I've never gotten this message before. Gemsbach again, but I've already seen them. All right, I gotta pause this because there's a lot going on. But yeah, I'm really happy with how this area is shaping up. And also, let's check. Uh, let's check the how's the view going. Uh. Oh, view's not the greatest. Hopefully, that will change pretty soon. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy with how this entire area is shaping up. Like, with this enclosure especially, like, it's like, it looks plain with, like, all the grasses and, like, the sparse trees. But it doesn't look empty, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, so I think that is a great place to end today's video. So next episode, we're going to finish up the area by adding the American bison in here, as well as all the other African animals right in here. So one last thing I have to say before I sign out, this week is my week of April vacation. So hopefully I'll be able to get one last video uploaded before I head back to school. That's either going to be the Manticorp Islands tour or the Future of Hammond's Dream Season 3 episode. But yeah, with that being said, that is going to wrap up today's video. Really hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If so, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe to see some more Planet Zoo and Jurassic World Evolution 2 content. And I will see you guys next time. Peace out.